No, I was only joking, please. Let's <laughs> um yeah, anyway. Oh well I'm I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna say a whole bunch of nice things, I promise. But hello everyone. Hang on, let me switch some screens around because I'm two screens away from where I'm actually using the browser, which in hindsight may not have been a good thing. Um but hello everyone. Um so amazing to be here. Wish we were in person. Well, wish we were all in person, but you know, uh, maybe in uh days ahead. Um, but yeah, this is a this is a talk I basically did at Drupal Camp Colorado. It was two a.m. local time when I did that, which was well, it was a bit tricky to stay awake. But um, any, anyway, thanks for thanks for joining. Thanks for listening. Hopefully, you all get something out of it. Actually, I'm pretty sure you'll get at least one thing, even if it's just the thing I'm about to do after this next bit, which is uh, just gonna before I get underway, just uh, pay a special heartfelt respect and acknowledgement to the Wagunja people. Who are the traditional owners in uh, in Narromine, which is in country New South Wales, where I'm presenting from today. Um, and hello again. Wish I was there. Maybe one day soon. Anyway, my dis my um, uh, the next bit is it actually comes with a disclaimer: uh, is that I love tech jokes, and I have a fairly hefty long list of them. Um, fortunately, tonight you're probably only going to get one, maybe two, maybe three, but we'll, at least one at the start. But um, this is this joke is open source, so please, if you like it, if it gives you, if it makes people face palm, please share it around. Just because you know, it's imp always important that we keep smiling, especially in current times. But I mean, just in general. Anyway, without further ado, why did the vulnerability get tired? Because it ran somewhere. Oh, I can feel the face palms already. <laughs> They're all this good, I promise. No, actually, some of them are probably worse. But anyway, you get the idea. But. <laughs> Hello, for those that I haven't met yet, my name is Developer Steve, actually legally, but we'll get to that. Um, one thing I was going to say is, yeah, I actually spoke at the last BrizzJS uh, and I did a talk. It was kind of meta because I did a talk on giving talks. Um, my 100th conference talk was in 2016 and I kind of stopped counting afterwards because I got to 100, yay. Um, but yeah, I've done talks literally all over the planet um, in the time before, as I call it, when we could travel. Uh, if anyone needs a hand putting a talk together or you've got an idea that you, you know, want some like, uh, talk ideas around, please reach out. I'm more than happy to um, geek out and, um, well, uh, tell you the ways that I'd approach the story and, and putting together the, the presentation deck. So um, let me know if you need some help. That was literally the talk that I did at BrizzJS, by the way. Anyway, um, and it's sad that they couldn't get any speakers because we were trying. Um, anyway, but hello, for those that I haven't met yet, my name is Developer Steve. Um, actually, legally, like I said, I've been doing talks and uh, 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 advocacy evangelism. I'm currently the senior, one of the senior uh, developer advocates at Sneak. Um, but yeah, I've been an advocate evangelist for a number of years now. A lot of conference talks, a lot of meetup talks, a lot of hackathons, many hackathons. Um, but it kind of reached a point that um, I would turn up to it. Well, I still do. I turn up to events and people go, hey, developer Steve. So when I got married a few years ago, that's my wedding photo on the top right. I 3D printed the top of that cake uh, the night before my wedding because what could go wrong? It didn't catch fire, so that was good. But um, yeah, we decided when we got married, we decided to combine our last names. So Cooper plus Houchin became Kuchin. And when I changed my, when I legally changed to my married name, I thought, you know what? I'm going to make developer Steve my middle name because everyone calls me it anyway. So there you go. It is actually on my license. It's not on my passport yet, but that's a whole other thing for a little while away. Um, but um, I've been coding for a number of years too. So I've literally been writing code since the age of eight. Shout out to QBasic. Oh, good old days. No library support. Well, I, no, there was no libraries. It was literally just writing code. Anyway, I'm... I'm um, uh, dithering <laughs> i have been running code for a long time now and um through my developer origin story spent a number of years in um, digital agency world where platforms like drupal were great because i could build out um apps and build out like end user experiences really really quickly and really really easily and as somebody that's um literally the product of the open source world as we all are in some way so much learning, so much sharing, everyone grows together, which I'm you a know, big fan of. Like it, we're literally products of the open source world. Remember to contribute back, but there's a slide for that that's coming. Uh, one of the things I love most, um, particularly like using my developer powers is just building out applications that in even just the smallest way, build out a, a consumer facing app or an end user app that just changes their day in that just that little way. Like it streamlines the process. It, 
builds them out, builds out a, um, a food ordering app or a social network or somewhere to share information and just connect. As a developer, like you, we, we build out these experiences, which is really cool. One thing I've always been mindful of, though, like in doing that, and uh, so many times, so many times, I still wake up in cold sweats over this. Deployed a particular like PHP platform, three weeks later, go back, have to clean it up because there's a rootkit on there. Is like when we deploy these applications, we don't often give security much thought, or at least you know over the years. And I think it's getting a lot better now because we're becoming more mindful of the vulnerabilities that are surfacing in the stuff we deploy. But if you think all those times where you've even just grabbed some code from Stack Overflow, I've done that and done a, a you know composer install or installed that particular module because it potentially someone said that it might solve that problem or it looks like it might. We don't necessarily know what else is being brought into our into our holistic iceberg app stack. And in so many times where I've just installed a thing and then you know had to go back a few weeks later because somebody or the, the client said there's a whole bunch of pop-ups now suddenly on the on the website and you, you get that big bill at the end of the month and we're using too much cloud resources all of a sudden so many times. <laughs> but again, like we build these experiences out with our end users in mind and sort of one of the things we have to be mindful of, particularly um, at the code front and when we're building these apps out is just to be aware what what we're building, put, we're putting our code on top of in a holistic stack. We leverage these amazing open source communities um, in so many different ways to be able to speed up the delivery of our app and also increase the functionality. But knowing, you know, what's inside that the stuff that we're deploying is almost paramount now these days to knowing how to protect those users that we're building the apps for. Oh, that was the name for the Stack Overflow bit. Anyway, time travel is a thing. We just did it. Hey. <laughs> One thing we see also, and anyone that's sort of been around the, um, well, is a seasoned product of the open source world. Oh, I like that. Anyway, <laughs> I think that's a sticker. But one thing we uh, we know and we see all the time is the exponential growth across um, open source ecosystems, which is phenomenally great because it means, you know, we've, we've got a thriving community of people contributing back and learning from each other and then adding back to the resources that we then use to build out our amazing applications. Of course, Drupal is no different. And as we know, like it's it's exponentially growing along with the internet, which is great. So there's over 130,000 websites currently using Drupal. This is according to Wapalizer. Um, across the, yeah, 130,000 websites currently using Drupal across the internet. Um, with millions of weekly project usage, uh, there it is. With, <laughs> I knew I was in there somewhere. With um, millions of uh, registered weekly project usage on from Drupal Core itself, which is great. Many of those are US, but um, I mean, Australia is mentioned in there, and that's good. <laughs> I, that's, I mean, that's irrespective now to the wider internet, just how much reach it has. Right? But of course, as we know, we're starting to see the, the growth of vulnerabilities starting to appear across the, the holistic ecosystem as these packages are growing as building out. So again, you think of all those times that you just compose or install a particular library or a particular repository, uh, or utilizing a particular repository, quite often not even go to giving much thought to the security side of things and what you're actually installing. And indeed, sometimes what the dependencies are being installed to, because quite often what we see in some of the ecosystems and PHP's more um, direct vulnerabilities that are being surfaced, and I've got an example of it tonight too, which I hope will work because we've already had our Murphy's Law tech failure moments, right? Yeah, we totally have. But um, something we see across some of the ecosystems is indirect dependencies causing vulnerabilities to surface above the water in, in our holistic iceberg stack. PHP um, is more on the direct side of things. So we see the vulnerabilities being surfaced in direct libraries, which is actually the one I'm going to be demoing tonight. One of the important things to always be doing, particularly for the security side of things, is just take a moment to do some due diligence with um, with stuff you're using and just have a look through any security alerts. Actually, the Drupal security team, shout out to Lee and the security team. Um, the Drupal security alerts are also a really good way to or be, um, sort of doing that due diligence and just being aware of what's what's out there, what's being patched, 
um, when I said before that uh, the Drupal security team is one of the best, one of the best, and I'm not gonna, I I don't like comparing platforms or languages at all because well I kind of use them all from time to time, but um, in particularly like that's just not good practice. But um, Dru the Drupal security team is legitimately very rapid in turning around any known vuns, anything that's spotted in the wild. Um, and the community itself, like the, the the ongoing sprint movement in its own right, like being able to patch stuff and fix things really, really quickly, just shout out to the work that's done there. Actually, Lee, I'm going to fill that form out. I totally, yeah, anyway, we'll talk after this. <laughs> um, which brings me to my next point too is, um, and I know everyone in the room already does this anyway, but I just like saying it is just remember to contribute back where you can, even if it's just, you know, verifying a readme, adding some extra notes or um, just doing some testing on a release candidate. Um, this is important because something we see holistically across all ecosystems and all, um, all libraries and communities is there's sometimes a delay in things being patched. Um, there's some stuff in, oh, I don't want to mention the language, but in another language where there's open vulnerabilities for several years while it's being debated amongst the community before maybe a patch will go out or a workaround is published to be able to fix that thing. But um, as open source um, enthusiasts, lovers, products of open source, um, just contribute back where you can. I know you all do. I just like to share. So here's some things. I'm going to start with PHP, and that's for a reason, because I'm going to lead into some Drupal stuff. Um, so this is looking more at the nuanced syntax at the app code side of things. And I know there's probably a few of you, you in the room are already scared because I get scared just looking at this slide. I mean, exe, shell exe, system and pass through, please don't ever use those. Um, or at least if you do, and one thing I always do with these particular PHP commands, I'm like, I've been using PHP since version four, um, even building some ISC bots back in the day. Is ISC still a thing? I mean, Slack kind of became that. Anyway, I'm, I'm sidetracking. But, um, I've never trusted these, particularly for anything that's being passed through from a user-facing input or an input that's accessible from the top of our iceberg. Um, obvious reasons, this, these commands basically give uh, shell access, if you will, or core operating system access to anything that is passed through to it. So naturally, these should be used extremely sparingly. Um, one thing I've always done whenever I've been tempted to use these for any sort of unusual reason is stepping back and sort of having a look at why I need to use these particular things. And usually you can use um, some alternatives like setting up some cron jobs or things that are being um, even passing variables through that you can multiple times sanitize and sanity check and put some nice logging around. But ultimately, please don't use these. Um, unless you really, 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 really have to. Anyway, I'm not going to go on about that one some more. Um, these two PHP commands, like we've seen a number of vulnerabilities appear around these particular ones. So strip tags, for example, only filters HTML. So it basically considers uh, JavaScript and SQL completely valid. Um, what can go wrong? <laughs> um, HTML entities won't sanitize completely, but you can, um, Is a, this is a good alternative, but you can actually define UTF character sets. There is a better option in the ones that I've uh, got listed down the left-hand side of here. Um, MB string to lower um, basically has usually has a lot of problems around out of bounds vulnerabilities via UTF character sets. So preg replace um, for those that are okay with regex or like regex. Wait, does anyone like regex? Put it in the comments. Um, I mean, it's not bad when it works, but um, Filter var is one of my favorite ways to start being able to filter or sanitize things because we should always sanitize things. Um, is one of my favorite um, syntaxes to use at the moment. And it seemingly gets a fair bit of air time because there's some really nice um, filter flags that you can load in there, like um, filter flag strip high, which will, it just gives you some options around defining what you can pass through it and how it works, et cetera. And there's, I don't want to say there's no vulnerabilities, but there's a lot less than the aforementioned. So anyway, now this one is really bad and I can already hear Lee going, don't mention it. Oh, I hope you said that. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk afterwards. Um, but unserialized, um, this one's so bad. Yeah, Hebe Dragons in PHP. And this is where um, I would opt to using JSON decode, JSON encode. 
Um, this one is actually so bad. It actually comes with a warning on a php.net site, so which says exactly what I just said. We opt for using JSON decode and JSON encode. Um, the serialized problem actually spans a number of ecosystems as well. This isn't just something we see in PHP, but um, one of the reasons why it's so bad is you can actually have functions passed into it and stored and then unstored or unserialized back out again. And also, I, I, uh, one of the debate topics around this one too is that unserialized is actually bad grammar. But anyway, we're not going to get into that one today. This one, unserialized, actually is um, so unsafe, I want to say. I wish they would just take it out. But anyway, there's probably a whole debate around this one. Um, this one is um, has been debated by some of the core internal PHP devs too. So this is a memo passed between a couple talking about um, some security vulnerabilities being raised. And then it was decided that the core team wouldn't recognize any vulnerabilities raised against unserialized anymore. So I can make this link available if anyone wants to have a look through. There's a very long discussion that basically talks about why they don't consider vulnerabilities uh, for unserialized anymore. So please don't use it very much. <laughs> Again, one of the things like, to do is to step back and look at why you would want to use it and see if you actually need to. And if JSON encode, JSON decode can be a nicer option. Um, the One of the things too to mention is um, why I was starting at PHP and sort of rolling up to the Drupal side of things is Drupal core itself has seen some issues with some of these core things before. So CVEs are like the security alerts that get raised against, um, well, through the, through the global security community. Um, and some of these issues have flowed on into Drupal core previously, but um, then promptly patched by the amazing security team. I'm really nervous now that there's a security, Drupal security person. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> We're all friends here. We're all friends. Um, so some of the things to keep in mind, um, particularly when uh, utilizing Dru Drupal just from the security coding side of thing, uh, is that the twig templates, anything between the curly brackets does get sanitized out. And this is important because we sanitize everything multiple times if possible, just to make sure. Um, there's also some really nice, um, really nice ways to be able to, inside Drupal core, to be able to handle the sanitization side of things as well. So using HTML escape, for example, for plain text, um, filter for stripping any HTML tags, and then also filter admin uh, for HTML that might be allowed for admin users. Although I would probably use that one sparingly as well, just to be sure, because Murphy's Law sometimes, Murphy's Law. Um, Drupal eval, um, and please tell me if I'm wrong, but this one actually didn't look like it was in Drupal 8 or 9. Um, totally tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know whether it's in 10. I haven't looked yet. But um, Drupal 7 does use Drupal eval, which uh, would, uh, going back to sort of some of the core PHP stuff, I would be, again, sort of looking at why you need to use it and if, if something can be handled a slightly different way, depending on what you need to do with it. Um, just remember when storing um, data, um, when storing data, the database layer works on top of the PHP PDO and uses an array of named placeholders. Of course, to make sure you correctly sanitize user input because we input or we sanitize everything multiple times, many, many times, as many times as possible sometimes. Um, there's actually a really good write-up on why you shouldn't trust um, form input value um, variables. And actually, Lee, I'm keen to talk to you about this one afterwards. Um, and this basically goes back to unserialized. Um, there is also a decode ent entities in Drupal 7 too. So um, check plane, one thing I did notice was that check plane uses client browser to provide additional temporary sanitization. Actually, there's a, oh, I thought I had a screenshot in there. There's a whole write up on this on the Drupal security site, um, which is one of the reasons why I want to fill that form out and join, because it says to use the client browser to do sanitization. Anyway, I'm keen to chat about that one because I don't know about that. But anyway, um, we should talk later. <laughs> um, the important thing, like when you're building these apps out, again, is you're building them out for with those end users in mind and making sure that you're um, you, you're spending so much time building them out, some amazing functionality. You also need to take in take some time to make sure you, that functionality that you build out you're building it out with also protecting their experience, their data, their time uh, on the security front as well. 
Of course, infrastructure now is elastic and it can be deployed really quickly, really easily um, with the application and also bring out some really nice elasticity, like Docker, for example, which was in the news today, in today's meetup as well. Um, so we've seen with Docker, um, well, things like containerization like Docker, there's over 242 billion downloads of Docker images today, which is really, really cool because, again, as you know, as a developer, as a DevOps, as somebody that builds out apps to not only um, be to scale out really, really quickly, but also it brings that elasticity to the platform as well, which is cool because it makes nice, fast, user experiences and it means I can build stuff locally and then transport it out and span clouds as quickly and easy. But also something we found is that um, these Docker images, for example, these container images carry the same vulnerabilities with them because they're built from the same open source components. So the top 10 Docker based images year on year carry known security vulnerabilities inside them. It's something we've even seen. Um, we I've got examples of this tonight, but um, the Drupal um, Docker container from Docker Hub actually has some known vuns in it as well. Mostly some configuration thing. Oh no, there is some open source stuff in there. Anyway, we're going to take a look at that in a little bit as well. So the way I like to think about this, and again going back to that whole keeping the end users in mind, protecting their experience, protecting your app and your infrastructure is with great containerization comes great responsibility. I think this is almost one another developer joke, but no, maybe not. Anyway, I just like that thing. <laughs> um, the last part of our holistic iceberg view is infrastructure as code. Um, and one of the things I love with this is having an app that you can reiterate and deploy really quickly and really easily through some nice CICD, some nice pipelines, is you can have some really cool gate controls in there so that Things get tested, things get checked before they get deployed. And well, I'm not a lazy dev, but when that automation works really well, like I'm always really thankful for it, especially when Jenkins passed my test first time. Yes, every time. No, there's always that one space that you find in your code that it finds in your code and it always stops them from deploying. But I mean, the fact that that's there just means, you know, there's something checking for those tiny little errors that I'm always going to throw that little spanner in the works usually the early hours of the morning. But anyway, um, one thing to keep in mind here is while those YAML files are really easy to be able to deploy your um, app really quickly and build out some infrastructure automatically or automagically, yeah, I like that one, um, the, that misconfiguration and in particular, like even permission settings in those configuration files, always something to keep in mind um, and even just giving like a second look over to make sure you've, you've got everything configured right or even a periodic review of the YAML that you're using or the deployable file configuration files that you are using just to make sure everything's up to date. Anyway, let's have a look at some demos which are totally gonna work first time. So this first one, um, this is actually a relatively new demo on the Sneak GitHub. We've got a whole bunch of, um, uh, oh, I should have brought it up. I'm gonna bring it up. Um, we've got a whole bunch of, oh, don't do that. Uh, good heart. Uh, would help if I was typing right. There we go. We have a whole bunch of these demo apps, uh, to do demo apps, which are really handy for being able to have a look at vulnerabilities in the wild. Um, these are ones that you can try at home. So this is a, a NPM uh, JavaScript one or an NPM one. That's still JavaScript. But as you can see, like there's a bunch of known vulnerabilities in there, and these are demos that you can try at home and please don't take the production. Um, the exploits folder in these ones, and I have a PHP one, which I am about to put on here as well. Um, there's one in Java, a couple of different languages. Um, but these, the exploits folder actually has a whole bunch of uh, known vulnerabilities that you can play with. So anyway, the one we're looking at tonight in PHP, I've got a to-do app running like that. Uh, and I'm using the common mark PHP league uh, Markdown uh, library. Uh, so there was a known vulnerability. There's actually been a few in this one. Um, this is a cross-site scripting attack, which again, going back to the sanitization side of things, doesn't sanitize particular um, user input. So when it's displayed back out again, yeah, it makes the app kind of vulnerable. So yeah, let's see if it works. Um, so this is a, it's a, it's a basic to-do app. Hopefully you can see that all, all okay. Yeah, I'll make it 
Um, this is a to-do app and the markdown library is part of the title, uh, the title input. So if I do, this is a test entry, then it just creates like a test entry, um, but it's markdown. So I can also do, this is a, oh, it's already there. I'm going to cheat. This is a bold statement and make it bold. <laughs> yes, it is. Anyway, if I, one of the things I can do there too is um, it's markdown so I can put links in. So this is a, I oh, see now the box is too small. There we, there we go. Yeah, I actually need to reposition that box. Work in progress. Um, I'll do a, put a to-do note for later. Actually, I can do that inside the to-do app. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. But yeah, I can do links inside that as well. So if I do a link there, I can hover over it and it's going to take me to that particular website. Um, one thing we see with cross-site scripting attacks is use things like links to be able to inject into um, the user's browser. And then you can do all sorts of nasty things with session stealing, cookies, redirects, all that sort of stuff. So one way to do that is, yeah, we definitely need to make that box bigger, um, is to be able to inject JavaScript as part of the link, uh, the markdown link formatting to be able to basically get around some of the library sanitization. So if I do that, for example, it doesn't work because the library sanitization function is able to work out that there's some character combinations in there that we really don't want in there. Um, one of the way the way to get around this particular one though is to URL encode and also use a common JavaScript word. Like uh, I can't put that. Actually, I'm just going to put it down here. Uh, is to URL encode some of the character types that for the malicious JavaScript payload you're trying to inject. And then to use a word like um, an object word like this in JavaScript or colon, which as a combination will basically get around the, the sanitization, the input. So if we put that one in, that actually works. So that there is now a clickable link, that gotcha. And if I click that, it opens uh, a, a, an alert box, a JavaScript alert box, which basically says gotcha. And again, like this is relatively harmless. So I'm just using alert box, but as a malicious actor, there's any number of nasty things that I could do inside that. Um, one way that I've previously, I've done some pen testing before, um, is remember those 25 words or less um, Facebook apps? Yeah, I built a platform that did that one time back in my digital agency days. And somebody else built an app one time on that platform that they didn't sanitize anything um, at all. And so it was one of those ones you, you know, enter, enter a question, 25 words or less, and it inputs into an app that everyone else can see the same entries in. And I was like, hey, you're not sanitizing JavaScript. You're not sanitizing anything that goes you know, into, into the app. Um, this is security vulnerable. Um, and they didn't fix it. So to prove it to them, I redirected everyone's app to my website for about three hours until they took it down. So I did tell them first, though, so... Always gray hat, always gray hat. Anyway, sanitize, sanitizing is super important. Um, like I was saying, this is the Docker library, the Drupal image from the Docker library from Docker Hub. That would be, that's the PHP one. Oh, I thought I had it in here. Anyway, no, no, okay. Um, yeah, this is the uh, Docker library for Drupal. Um, I've actually run some scans on this. Let's see where it is. There it is there. Um, as you can see, there's some issues that do does get brought up as with some of the images, relatively light. Oh, actually, some of those have changed since I last looked at this. See, I should have looked at it beforehand. Um, a lot of these are, again, related back to open, known open source library issues. Um, some of these may be false positives, but being able to see some potential issues arising and then doing, again, doing that due diligence is the thing I always find handy. Um, there's a couple of other, I've actually been scanning a whole bunch of things on here lately. Actually, here's one, this is actually a, where did it go? There's a thing in here I normally talk to. This is a, um, the microservices demo from Google Cloud Platform, for example. Um, if we open one of the, let's just go front end, you'll see the, there we go. Oh, and I picked the one with no issues in it. Well, that one, see, there's no due diligence there. You just, your job's done. Um, wait, I could have picked one. There we go, add service. Um, when I was saying the, 
yeah, there we go. Although I could have picked a better one. This one's fine. Um, this is something we see commonly appear in a lot of the YAML configuration files. So container is running without root user control. Um, again, this gives me the opportunity to do some due diligence and decide whether this is something I need to fix or this is something which affects my stack because that does vary a bit. But again, that due diligence is the thing you want to be doing. One thing I'm going to mention here before I switch back to the slides, because I know I'm probably running out of time, is uh, we, when I did this talk originally at Drupal Co uh, in Colorado, Drupal Camp Colorado, we were getting ready to launch uh, code scanning for PHP in beta. And I'm happy to say it's now actually launched. So I've been looking at Drupal and I was talking to uh, Vlad about this as well. So um, PHP is launched now and you can basically the sneak code engine will now uh, identify potential issues in PHP code bases that are worth looking into from a due diligence side of things. Um, I've been going through some of the Drupal ones. Um, Lee totally needs to talk. Um, there's some interesting stuff in there. And the way that this these are identified is what we do on the machine learning, uh, sneak code machine learning engine. The team behind it loads in the complete um, language function object, like the complete library, complete language syntax for a particular language. And we use that based against known CVE types to be able to identify combinations of language that um, and it's able to work out that the different combinations that can cause those known vulnerabilities to appear. So, and that's where these highlighted issues have come from. Now, the thing that it does let you do is also dig through that and understand more what you're looking at. Some of these will be false positives, but again, doing that due diligence to understand why they're, why they're potentially an issue is always the thing I always find interesting, just digging back through and having a look to see what's there. Um, Anyway, this is also in beta, so we're looking for feedback and people to play with it, basically, and load some stuff in. I've been through so many PHP projects that I've used in the past, in the last few, last week or so. The, yeah, I have a lot of projects running, being scanned at the moment. Anyway, um, just thought I'd point that one out. And again, looking for feedback. So if anyone's got any plugins or anything they want to throw at it and yeah, um, chat about their findings. Actually, I'm always looking for speakers for Sneak Live uh, live streams. So completely informal, we just get on there and geek out and like dig through stuff like this and have a look through it. So anyway, I'm going to switch back to the slides and wrap up because I can feel the chat going off. Um, probably just face palms. But we did miss one really important step in our four section ice cube, iceberg, holistic iceberg view. Um, the, the most important part we missed was the developer environment. Um, this one really scares me a whole lot because I have a local developer environment that I really like it. Um, and the vulnerabilities, please go away. No, um, something we're seeing now in, um, is an emergence of vulnerabilities appearing in developer environments. Um, and one of the demos I've actually been doing, in fact, I normally have a link to it on this one, but it's on my GitHub, um, is VS Code, which has 14 million monthly users. Some of the extensions now are having uh, remotely accessible vulnerabilities appear in the extensions. So the four that we originally published some research around this was Latex Workshop, Open in Default Browser, Instant Markdown, which I've got a demo of, a walkthrough demo to do on my GitHub. Um, and I swear this last one's real. I'd never used it, but um, Rainbow Fart. Yeah, that's a VS Code extension. Um, the Instant Markdown one is probably... I mean, they're all scary, but the instant markdown one, why it scares me so much is it's actually a remotely available file traversal onto a local machine. So the first time this was demoed, actually, this was demoed on Sneak Live by my manager, Lyra. Hi, Lyra. Um, but the uh, security researcher using that vulnerability was able to lift his password file from his Mac. So please, if you're using these extensions, make sure they're in the latest version because we've actually worked with the, the repos, the, the maintainers to be able to update and fix them since. Um, but you can use the previous version to have a look at this vulnerability in the wild. Just do not leave it installed, please. Very please. Um, we've also got full write-ups in this too, but I have links in my readme on how to, how to set it up I, on my GitHub, so security research. Um, 
just lastly, if you have already, if you have still got Drupal 7 sites in the wild, please update to 8, 9, or coming soon 10. Um, I'm sure you already have migration plans in, underway. I just wanted to mention that just so it takes less versions of the security folks to maintain because they want to be able to move on to the new stuff and keep everyone safe in 8 and 9, which they do really well. But, you know, anyway, upgrade to 7. Upgrade from 7. Yeah. Um, and always make sure you're scanning source code containers infrastructure and also just be aware of what you're installing in your dev environment. Actually, I, one thing I didn't mention on that other slide is Homebrew also put out an alert um, for those that are using Homebrew saying that they had a um, vulnerability, known vulnerabilities uh, a couple of months ago. There's a blog post they've got um, up still about it. So anyway, worth having a look at. Um, just going to mention SneakCon 2021 coming up in a few weeks in October. It's free to attend. Troy Hunt's actually speaking at it uh, as well. So uh, look forward to his and everyone else's session. Um, there's a whole bunch of industry people that'll be at this one too. So grab tickets if you're interested in finding out more about security stuff. And just lastly, please always remember to use your tech superpowers for good. I know you all do. I just really like this GIF and always like mentioning it. Also, Bill and Ted. Um, and always remember to be excellent to each other. Thank you very much. <laughs>